Hi everyone, I'm Liam and I'm also here with Gray. We're both lecturers at Edge Hill University and we're going to be talking to you today about a project that we're doing with Gaming Lab entitled Board Gaming on the Spectrum. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit later about the board gaming side and I'm going to pass over to Gray now who's going to talk to you some more about autism. Around 4% of the population has a clinical diagnosis of autism. However, autistic traits are normally distributed in the general population. This means all of us have, to a degree, autistic traits. Autism is also a heterogeneous condition, meaning there are many different traits that a person may possess, and not all individuals with the diagnosis share these traits. These traits involve atypical social and communication styles, such as language delays, atypical um, eye contact. They also have a preference for structure and systems, so a preference for maths, sciences, and liking to follow a routine. They also have restricted and repetitive interests, which include a deep and engrossing interest in an, a specific domain or a narrow field, such as knowing everything about trains. Many autistic people also have a difference in relation to theory of mind or being able to take someone's perspective. This includes an impairment in understanding other people's mental states and being able to read emotions. So if we think about what playing a board game involves, there's considerable overlap in these topics. So social skills and communication are fundamental to any multiplayer board game. Playing games relies on communicating with the other players and having good sportsmanship. And even in a competitive game, there's still an aspect of teamwork and cooperation. In order to progress in your joint goal of finishing the game, you all need to work together to do so. Board games are also heavily systematic. There's a very clear structure in how you progress through the game, and games have a very clearly defined set of rules. Board games, at their very heart, are very mechanical and mathematical and depend heavily upon logic and strategizing. So just taking these first two categories for a moment, there seems to be a clear path for board games tapping into some of these strengths of autistic individuals and for affording an opportunity for the development and furthering of new skills. Indeed, there's already a lot of research suggesting that social interactions may be less motivating and more stressful for those on the spectrum. Board games, therefore, could afford a space for social interactions where there's a built-in structure and flow to interactions. There's also considerable overlap in terms of common restricted interests and popular themes in tabletop games. The majority of people with a clinical diagnosis of autism and people with a high degree of autistic traits have restricted interests. Restricted interests aren't always negative. They can be a strength to those with the condition. Engaging with restricted interests can be highly motivating for individuals, and they can lead to expertise in a given area. They're also found to be extremely enjoyable and engaging. Some of the more common restricted interests include themes like space, sci-fi, mechanics, fantasy, even animals. And popular board game themes already align quite well with these common restricted interests. So some examples are games like Ticket to Ride or um, Roll for the Galaxy or Root. So social interactions can be very stressful for people with autism and having a game revolve around a topic that they are already familiar with can ease this stress and afford a more rewarding and productive experience. Playing games that involve restricted interests may improve motivation for the interactions that are inherently embedded in gameplay. They may also improve immersion for people on the spectrum. They can also offer the autistic individuals an opportunity to display their knowledge and expertise that could lead to more inclusion. So we've seen how board games already have a lot of overlap with various aspects of autism. Now we're going to focus more on theory of mind, one of the most researched areas of autism. So theory of mind is a term used to describe the process of understanding what another person is thinking, and many board games are essentially at their root all about theory of mind. So before we explore this in depth, we're going to explain a bit more about theory of mind. So theory of mind is an umbrella term that's used to describe the process of understanding what someone else is thinking. It involves taking another person's perspective, reading or inter interpreting someone's emotions, or acting in a way that fulfills certain social goals. 
Autistic people display differences in theory of mind based on their performance on theory of mind tasks, specifically those that involve interpreting an individual's emotions from facial or eye cues, asking people to interpret social situations, or imagining the perspective, visual or mental, of other agents. Autistic people tend to not perform as well on these tests as neurotypicals. But as you can see, theory of mind is quite a broad term and it's used to describe a variety of things, but it can be broken down and categorized in a number of ways. One useful way to break this up is in terms of online and offline theory of mind. Online theory of mind involves reading or acting things out in the moment, while offline theory of mind involves using previous knowledge or thinking about mental states more logically. Another way to think about theory of mind is in terms of primary and secondary theory of mind. So if we take this picture to the right, here in green, we have an example of primary theory of mind. The girl is looking at the cat and she's imagining what's going through the cat's mind. For secondary theory of mind, we have here in blue this man who is wondering what the girl thinks the cat thinks. So second order theory of mind is a more complicated version than the first. It also develops later and it's a useful way to distinguish types of theory of mind processes. So playing a board game involves all of these different aspects and levels of theory of mind. Different kinds of games will load more heavily on different levels or types of theory of mind. Let's take a game like Dixit. Imagine we're all playing Dixit together and I'm the clue giver. I know that Liam knows my sister used to play violin and the other players do not. As I get more points if only Liam gets it right, I might want to give the clue sister for a card like this. To play this game well, I need to have good knowledge of the people I'm playing with or what kind of clue is not too easy or too hard. But I won't need to interpret other people's emotions or act or bluff. I also don't really need to think about what someone thinks about another player or use any extended theory of mind reasoning. Now let's take a game like One Night Ultimate Werewolf. This also involves secondary theory of mind as well as more live or online processes like reading emotions, acting or bluffing. Here I need to not only think about what Grey thinks or what you all might think, but also think about what everybody else thinks about each other. If I'm to successfully convince someone else, convince you that someone else is the wolf or pass off my Tanner as the werewolf, I then need to reflect on all of these thoughts about your thoughts and change my behavior accordingly. So while almost all board games involve theory of mind in some way, they are all also positioned on a spectrum of perspective taking abilities. While games like Dixit involve only prior person knowledge, games like Werewolf also involve a more online or live emotion reading and acting. And this is at the crux of what our project is about, understanding how different types of board games relate to and might be used to bootstrap or improve theory of mind. So we've been thinking about how to taxonomize theory of mind in board games, how to categorize board games in their use of theory of mind, from those that are very low in theory of mind to those that are higher. So on the left, we have those games that are very heavy in theory of, theory of mind and involve most aspects of it. So games like Werewolf or Coup that involve online bluffing, mind reading, and both primary and secondary order theory of mind. Then we have games like Dixit or Codenames, which while they don't involve any live reading or acting, they still involve you thinking about your opponent's or your teammate's mind. They still involve first order theory of mind. Then we have games that are on the lower end of the theory of mind spectrum that don't involve much acting, bluffing or mind reading, but do still involve thinking about the other players. And these can be split into those that are high on cooperation and teamwork and are more social. So games like Firewatch or Chronicles of Crime. And then on the far right, we have those games that use the least theory of mind, the more competitive, mathematical and solitary experiences. So games like Brass or Carcassonne that involve very little interaction. You don't really need to think about what the other person knows or is thinking. There's very little bluffing or mind reading involved you're all very much doing your own thing or on your own path. 
So to summarize, there's a lot of overlap with board games and autistic interests and autistic strengths and weaknesses. With the right exposure, we believe board games can offer a naturalistic opportunity for autistic and non-autistic people to engage. An experience that builds on the interest and strengths of autistic individuals and affords an opportunity for enjoyable social interactions in a setting with clear and predictable rules. It also offers a potential avenue to bolster theory of mind and perspective taking and as well as social and communicative skills. So like any good plan, ours has three steps. The first is to understand the links between autism, autistic traits, and board gaming. The second phase involves undertaking empirical work which tests our predictions about board gaming and the theory of mind taxonomy and to test whether certain games can improve aspects of theory of mind. The final phase is to use what we have learned in phase one and two and develop an autism friendly board game that improves theory of mind and social communication. So when we first started delving into the literature around autism, theory of mind and board games, we were quite surprised at the dearth of work that's already been done in this area. So as a first step, we're interested in surveying board gamers to understand and establish the links between the prevalence of autistic traits in this population, as well as understanding a little bit more about preferred gaming themes and mechanics and how these all might relate. Our next step then involves going to board gaming cafes in the UK to playtest our taxonomy with both autistic and neurotypical focus groups. From these two projects, this will form the basis of the foundations on which we'll build our empirical work. The empirical work has two main aims. Firstly, to establish the links made with board gamers and theory of mind in our taxonomy and test its predictions. So one such prediction would be whether people who have better second order theory of mind perform better at a game in this category, such as Werewolf or Q. And the second aim here is to establish causality. So to assess if these games can afford the opportunity to bootstrap these skills. So can playing a game like Werewolf bolster or improve second order theory of mind? The ultimate aim of our work is to draw on all these findings and develop an autism friendly board game through a collaborative design with autistic players. This is where we will build on existing interests and strength in autistic individuals and incorporate these elements, mechanics, and themes that are most useful in developing specific skills within the context of building an autism gaming community. Thank you all for listening. Our email addresses are at the bottom if anyone wanted to get in touch. Would be good to hear from you all.